Welcome to this oral history interview, part of the developing series of interviews focusing on live music venues and experiences on Route 66, centered around Springfield and Greene County, Missouri, and Lebanon and Pulaski County, Missouri. This series is supported in part by a grant from the Route 66 Corridor Preservation Program of the National Park Service. My name is Craig Amison. I'm with Missouri State University Libraries, and today's date is January the 11th, 2022. And our special guest today is Mark West, owner of Down Home Productions in Nixa, Missouri. Is that correct? Correct. This interview is taking place in the Dwayne G. Meyer Library on the campus of Missouri State University. Mark, thank you so much for agreeing to participate in this project and for coming here today to talk with me. Okay, no problem. Uh, first of all, the toughest question of all, when and where were you born? I was born in Clinton, Missouri in, in December 1960, which That's is Henry County. When did you move into the Springfield area? I came to Springfield in August of 1979 to be a music major, and also I came down here a week or two early because I've been accepted in Bob Scott's marching band, the Bruin marching band. This was, he was the, the band instructor before Jerry Hoover. Um, so that's when I came down here. I came down here because of music. I saw Southwest Missouri as being the best place in the state of Missouri for music. I, I wasn't rich enough to go, you know, five or six states away because Generally, it costs more money to, to go to college out of state. I'm interested to know how you knew that Southwest Missouri was such a, a mecca of music. Well, initially, in the summer of 78, I came down here to visit College of the Ozarks. I think that's maybe what it was called then. Mm -hmm. And uh, my cousin, Adele, who was from Clinton, Missouri, she's she was the daughter of my dad's little brother. She was in drama at College of the Ozarks. And we came down to visit there because I knew that they had a dairy barn and, and I just got off a summer of milking dairy cows. And uh, I knew that you could work your way through college at School of the Ozarks. So we came down, uh, we camped along the river there by Taney Como, just around from what's Brand Branson Landing now. Okay. And uh, Oh, we, we went to see one of her plays in the Beacon Hill Theater. And um, the next day, that Saturday, uh, we had scheduled to go to Silver Dollar City with some friends of ours that were from Springfield that we'd went to Bible camp with over, over by St. James, Missouri. And there, the family name was the Odells. There was like four brothers and one daughter and they lived on Fremont Street here in Springfield. And uh, so so while we were making the trip down here, we went to Silver Dollar City with them on that Saturday. And then we drove back the back way to Springfield, which I know very well now, I didn't so much then. Right. We drove up 160 through Nixa. Back then, Nixa only had the one bridge across the James River. And it was a, a two-lane highway, and we spent the night with them on Fremont Street, and then we got up the next morning and went to church at University Heights Baptist Church. And all those Odell brothers played on the University Heights Baptist Church softball team. Well, we went over to Lambda Kai House, I think it was, that was over on off of Elm Street back then. Back then, all the sorority and fraternity houses at Southwest Missouri State were spread kind of all over town. Okay. Um, we went over there to pick up Jay, and uh, Jay was the oldest one of the Odell brothers. And, you know, I told him I was looking at going to College of the Ozarks. I wanted to study music. I knew that there were fiddle players at Silver Dollar City in Southwest Missouri, and I was into fiddling and, and acoustic guitar and percussion and all that stuff. So that's, that was what attracted me to the area it was, you know, Southwest Missouri, Branson, Silver Dollar City, School of the Ozarks. You know, at the time I hadn't even really thought about Springfield or, or Southwest Missouri State. 
Well, anyway, Jay, out of nowhere, when we talked about why I was coming down here, he was like, well, you should go to SMS. They got a great music program. Okay. And uh, I probably didn't think about it too much that day, mm -hmm. but when I got back to uh, Henry County, back to Chilhowee, actually Chilhowee's in Johnson County, but it's, it's close to the county line. Uh, when I got back to Chilhowee, I probably, I don't remember this too well, but I probably called uh, Southwest Missouri State's main phone number mm -hmm. and asked for them uh, information on the college. And I knew nothing about it then. I knew more about Central Missouri State than I did about Southwest Missouri State because I went to high school at Leeton, which technically is in Johnson County, and I was in the marching band there, and we marched it at the homecoming parade. Every year I was in marching band there and we went to music contests there. So I knew I knew a lot more about Central Missouri State. My older brothers and sisters had graduated from there. So, you know, I'm thinking SMS. I didn't see SMS as being as big a deal as CMS back then. Right. Uh, so I called down here and I'm sure they sent me a catalog and a brochure and I'm, at some point, I'm like, well, that's where I'm going to go. I don't no, remember exactly what, what tipped that over the edge. What was, was the music? The music the, was the, the big deal. Yeah. And probably that I didn't quite want to go to school the Ozarks. I wanted to go to school more like my brothers and sisters did. And it, at some point, I enrolled... I had to take, you know, the ATC, is that it? ACT, ACT yeah. test mm -hmm. at Central Missouri State's where I took that. Okay. And I don't know what my score was, but I guess it was good enough to get into SMS. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I enrolled in SMS, and in June of June of 1979, I was milking cows all that summer, but I probably took off that day to come down here with my dad. And we didn't even know where to park. I think we parked in the central maintenance parking lot between, <laughs> uh, uh, what is it, Kemper Hall and central maintenance, mm -hmm. right there by Grand Street. Right. And then we walked over to the campus union and went through the student orientation mm -hmm. and registration. And I remember because I had was going to declare to be a music major that my counselor, who was in, who I got put with that day, was a guy named Jim Ellswick, and he was a trumpet teacher, trumpet player, a horn guy, and, uh, you know, they showed, I think they split us up, you know, they took my dad probably around certain places, and then they took me around certain places. Our meetings that I remember were in the campus union, and uh, so I signed up for a lot of music classes, signed up for a class or two I probably shouldn't have taken, which was like history from the <laughs> way back when, Henry VIII. <laughs> I hated that class. It was all essay and it was boring as hell. But uh, so student orientation and registration, I wasn't sure I was gonna get into marching band. I remember probably in early August, I remember getting off the John Deere tractor, raking hay in the bottom to walk to the house to call Bob Scott back at exactly four o'clock, you know, because back then that's the way you had to do it. You had to call them when you knew they were going to be in the office. Mm -hmm. So I got in the band probably by the skin of my chinny chin chin, and uh, I came down here a week early. Uh, marching band practice was right down there on that field, that same field. Band house was there on the corner of Kings and Madison. And I mean, I was overwhelmed. I was an overwhelmed country boy. Everyone in band was probably better than me. Uh, and that's where it started. And then, you know, a week, week and a half later, classes started. And, uh, you know, I, I didn't know my roommate. At the time I came to town, those Odell brothers were the only ones I knew. And a girl I'd went to high school with, her and her soon to be husband, we're going to Central Bible College. Mm -hmm. Those are the only people I knew in town. Uh, 
And so I started to meet people in the dorm. I didn't even know my roommate. I had just put down I wanted a room with somebody who was interested in music. Uh -huh. Well, Scott Stanley was a guitar player, and I found out he wound up working concerts at Hammond Student Center, and that was probably the first time I thought to myself, oh, you can do that. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I met the guys that lived across the hall from me. I, I, I lived in Freddy 333. In fact, coming in here today, I walked right by that room. Uh, and the guys that lived across the hall from me, I played two of them I played basketball against at Leeton. They had went to Warsaw. So, you know, we kind of hit it off with them. And yeah. we always had, a, you know, a lot of good times together. You know, and then I started to meet more people in the hall. And I'd meet people in classes. And, you know, it just kind of kept growing. So... I don't know how much. So, so, yeah, so, so you're there here in the late 1970s and you're starting to meet people. You're probably starting to get out some off the campus eventually. What, what was the live music scene like in Springfield when you started to, to branch out off campus? Well, I really didn't know so much about it back then. I mean, I knew about the Ozark Mountain Daredevils. Mm -hmm. I knew about Granny's bath, bath Water, you know, and then they started having acts play on the North Mall between Blair Shannon and the bookstore. Okay. Um, so, you know, I got to see some of them. I also noticed that there was the Campus Union Board at the time. Now it's called Student Activities. Uh, and Dan Sullivan, who was the president of that, lived in Freddie. And uh, so I started gathering all these parts and pieces. I didn't know so much quite about the live music scene around town yet because I wasn't 21 yet mm -hmm. and so it was a, that was a couple years off before I started exploring that probably about 1980 or 81. Uh, so the drinking age was was 21 at the time? Right. Okay. And I didn't turn 21 till uh till my sophomore year. Mm -hmm. Well wait a minute. Yeah in 20, December yeah, yeah my, soft, my sophomore year. Right. No, that would have been my junior year. It was my junior year because okay. my freshman year was 79, sophomore year was 80, 81. So, yeah, so you had been here over two years right. before, you, before you could even go into I turned 21 in December of 81. And did you know about any of those places or were they just... Yeah, I did. Uh, there was some of the un underage stuff like... Cedar Shake in the Armory. I think we went out to some of those dancing and stuff. Uh, uh, some of them had bands. So that was my earliest, uh, you know, local, local live music scene. Mm -hmm. And then after I turned 21, the first club I went into after I was of age was Humphrey Clinkers at the corner of Elm and National. Mm -hmm. Right there in the same building with the Brown Derby Central. Okay. Yeah. And I went to see the Undergrass Boys, the Bluegrass folk. You know, those guys were great. And, you know, uh, we, we had uh, done a show or so at the Campus Union Board that they played at. Okay. So, and, you know, I started hearing about this band called Fool's Face. They, uh, John got booked a show at McDonald Arena with Fool's Face, The Debs, and The Secrets. The Secrets were a Kansas City band. The Debs were an all-girl band from Springfield. And then Fool's Face. Fool's Face still has reunions. Uh, I don't think they're having one this year because of COVID. But, uh, so that was like some of my first stuff. And then... Where was Fool's Face out of? They were out of Springfield. Okay. Uh, a lot of them had went to SMS as well. Okay. And maybe, you know, they went to, went to high school at Glendale. And uh, so then by 82, it starts expanding. Somewhere in there, the hangar opened, which the hangar was a Quadsit hut behind what was Central Dodge. Then they tore down Central Dodge. They moved over by KY3. And they built a Dillon's there, Dillon's Grocery Store, which now Price Cutter's in there. Mm -hmm. Well, right behind that store, 
Quadsit Hut didn't exist anymore, but the concrete pad that it was on is still there. Okay. And uh, it was kind of an awkward layout. You know, they had the stage under one corner of the Quadsit Hut, and then they had a pool table, and then the bathrooms, and then the bars, and then this area out here was all seating. I'm going I'm to come back to the hangar uh, also before we get there. What you, you mentioned some of the acts that were played. Was it common for large acts or bands from around the country to appear, to appear in Springfield, or were they mostly regional performers? Mostly, like say the hangar, they were regional. Mm -hmm. You know, they'd have acts out of Kansas City or Wichita, okay. or maybe I don't know about Tulsa. Probably Tulsa. Mm -hmm. And there, there would be people who would remember that better than me. But uh, I know there were Kansas City bands that played in there. When um, in 1984, there was a band out of Wichita, Kansas called The Clocks. And they had a song, She Looks a Lot Like You. And that was on MTV quite a bit. And the significance of The Clocks were, well, they were a good band. But they were also managed by the same management in Kansas City that the Ozark Mountain Daredevils were using, Good Karma. And I remember uh, going in the club that night, and Danny Mayo was there. He was the Ozark Mountain Daredevils lighting director and production manager. And uh, Larry Lee was there from the Daredevils. And... Uh, so I just remember that, and I remember them being really good. Yeah, the fact that you were paying attention to who was there means that you're probably more, you were probably more astute about that sort of thing than the average Joe that comes in and walks in and is going to hear a band tonight. You're paying attention to who's right. actually there. Right. I would pay attention to not only the band, right. but who the band's sound engineers and lighting guys were, who their management or booking agency was. You know, I started paying attention to the to whole picture. Is that because you were a music major, or is that because well, that just interested you? Well, here's the deal about the music major thing. I was a music major for a year. Okay. And during that time, I figured out you could work shows. You know, my, my roommate, who worked concerts, back then the students were the stagehands at Hammond Student Center for Dick Magruder. And... I just remember thinking, you know, he's working REO Speedwagon and maybe Journey and Black Sabbath. And I'm like thinking, oh, man, you could do that. You know, I, I wasn't doing so great with music. M music. Uh, I got A's in music theory one and two. I got a B in music theory three, which would have been my sophomore year. Uh I, I wasn't that great a player. I got in a late start way back in grade school and then even high school. And I played percussion, so I read rhythms and not notes so much. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was just behind everybody. Everybody's better than me. Plus, they were just probably naturally better at it. But I just thought, well, you know, I'm a farm boy. I've driven tractors and fork, you know, I hadn't driven forklifts still down here, but. You know, that's something I could probably do. Mm -hmm. So my second year, I declared undecided. And I started exploring that. Like the first week of my sophomore year, I set out to join the Campus Union Board. And uh, like, the, like the first week or two, I, the first show I ever worked was a band called Burgundy Rose. They played the North Mall between Blair Shannon and the bookstore. And back then, the bear paw wasn't there. You had to pull the staging out of the basement of the campus union. And I remember helping do that. There's a guy named Tom, can't remember Tom's last name, that was the technical director, and Craig Young. So I started meeting all those people. And then meeting guys like Dave McKay, who was over the concerts at the campus union board and the shows that happened at McDonald Arena. Mm -hmm. So, uh... And through that, I got on, well, you, my, I, my sophomore year, I didn't room with the same guy. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if I should tell why or not. He was selling pot out of the, out of the, <laughs> out of the dorm room, and I 
I thought, well, you know, I was a naive little farm boy. I thought, well, you know, I probably better not uh, be around that. So I wound up rooming with a guy named Dick Moore, who I'd met my freshman year. He he hung out with the guys that lived across the hall from me, and we roomed in Freddie 215 for two years. And Dick was from Kirkwood, so I got introduced to all these people from St. Louis mostly, and some from Kansas mm -hmm. City, mm -hmm. you know, because there are a lot of those that came to school down here. Well, I was kind of one of them. I, I grew up close, you know, south of Kansas City. So uh, uh, it just kind of my my environment and the people I knew started expanding. Yeah. And I had taken so many music credits my freshman year that I started realizing that. Uh, well, I had a I had a different counselor because when I went from music to undecided. They put me with someone else. Right. And we started exploring that and going, well, you know, you only need like two more credits and you get a music minor. Because right. uh, I'd taken so many. Right. So, you know, it was kind of my second year in college. I decided, well, I think I'm going to explore working shows. And if I'm going to do that, I probably ought to study electricity and electronics. So that's what I changed my major to my junior year, and that's what I got my degree in, a Bachelor of Science in Education, or in Industrial Education and Technology with the emphasis in uh, electricity and electronics. And that's helped me a lot through building my company oh, yeah. uh, because I understand electricity, and I understand, I still remember a lot about electronics, even though I don't think about some of that stuff on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so that's that's where I wound up at. Uh, major in electricity and electronics, minor in music. And you know, I started working more shows at Hammond Student Center. By my senior year, I was on the A V crew over there working for Dick Magruder and I was booking the shows for the campus union board. Uh first first I was the technical director at Campus Uni Board my second year over there, which would have been my junior year. And then my senior year, I was special attractions and I wound up booking shows that happened in McDonald Arena and in the North Mall and in the Blair Shannon Lobby. And we did Helen Hudson in the Campus Uni Lobby. And we did Gene Cotton in the Campus Uni Ballroom, which is now, which is now their banquet room. It's kind of still a ballroom, but they changed it some. And we did shows in Carrington Hall Auditorium. We did, in 81, we did John McCune and Craig Hall. So I had done shows in about every imaginable, imaginable place at Missouri State. Yeah, so, so you were already, so you were sort of getting a sensibility uh, on campus here for, for what was going on, not only front stage, but behind the stage at places that you would go later off campus, I'm sure. Right, right. Yeah. Well, see, and the more I started doing it, the more I started doing stuff off campus. Mm -hmm. My first three years of college, I went home for the summer and worked on worked on the farm. Stayed, my dad had a farm and I worked for other farmers. Mm -hmm. My, my, in the summer of 1983, I got on as a Substitute fall spot operator at Swissville Amphitheater, brand new place. I was at the very first gig they ever did, which was uh, Jerry <laughs> Jerry Reed, the country artist. <laughs> also did a lot of studio work. Great guitar player. Uh, and I got that contact through Chancey Van Pelt, who opened Hammond Student Center in 1976. He came here from Las Cruces, New Mexico, and he's the one that brought Dick Magruder who was in charge of the technical end of it and actually made the shows happen once they were booked. And Dick and I later become good friends and uh, and I work for him and uh, anyway. <laughs> so so that summer, not only did I work at Swiss Villa, I probably, uh, granted I was supposed to be a substitute guy, but I wound up running fall spot for like 12 or 15 shows. And then what I would do what I would do during the week or when I wasn't doing anything else, I would help these guys that owned a little sound system load into Lindbergh's for like 
twenty dollars in beer mm -hmm. or thirty dollars in beer. Yep. We did acts in there like Nancy and Norman Blake. We did Newgrass Rever Revival. Newgrass Revival has a ton of people you'd recognize. You know, Sam Bush, Mayla Fleck, John Cowan, who's playing for the Nitty Gritty or John Cowan's playing for the Doobie Brothers now. Mm -hmm. But uh, all those guys played at Lindbergh's. That's really cool. And um, so my, my working in clubs around town just kept expanding. You know, I worked with John Gott and Dynamite Sound, and I get put doing, I was more of a lighting guy mm -hmm. because there were always seemed to be sound guys. I got put on a, a head east show <laughs> at the hangar with Larry Hampton. Hampton was doing sound and I was doing lights. And uh... let, let's move, let, let me move to Route 66 for a moment because you, you mentioned the hangar now several times. In, in your memory before 1985, was it a big deal that Route 66 came through Springfield? No, no one ever talked about it really. Not so much looking back with nostalgia as so many people around the world do now, but from the perspective of when, when it was there, it was probably not thought of as, oh, this is Route 66. Right, yeah, and you know, back during that time, I don't know that I ever thought about it. Mm -hmm. I don't know that I really even knew that mm -hmm. it came through town. Same thing with the Ozarks Jubilee. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was here 55 through 60, which Long was it, right? which was before I was born, right. you know. Um, so I didn't even really, you know. I did a couple shows in the '80s for Cy Simon, and I didn't even really know about it then. And he was the guy that produced it. Right, right. Uh, I just knew that Cy was a big deal. Like he had done some stuff. I didn't even know that at the time. At the time I did these shows for him, I didn't even know that he had published. Um, always on my mind in the letter that Elvis and the box tops and Joe Cocker and Willie Nelson had done. Yeah. So yeah, I didn't, his career was greater than the Ozark and Jubilee too. So that's right. Know. And I didn't know a lot of this history till later on down the road. Right, right. That's that's what I suspected. Um, so you know if you, if you were a club owner um, or live music venue owner back when Route 66 was still a numbered highway, I wonder would it have been important in Springville to be located on the Mother Road? I, I don't think so. Okay. Because there were other there were other showcase bars like in the in the bottom of the bowling alley, which is now Andy B's. Mm -hmm. uh, the first I remember that was called the it was called the Mother Load first and that was maybe no it might have been and then after that it was called homers and it might have been about that time was the first time i saw the rainmaker guys they before the rainmakers they were called steve bob and rich this is a kansas city band but before they were called steve bob and rich they were called boys town and I saw them at either the bottom line or Homer's. It was in that venue. Mm -hmm. They opened for Fool's Face, and uh, that's when I met them. I, I, I think I still have that card, Boys Town, and they would they would become a bigger act than Fool's Face. You know, once they got the Polygram record deal, that's when they changed their name to the Rainmakers, and they added a drummer, and they were. They were pretty, you know, they were probably more regional, but but they were national and also international. I mean, they love them in Norway. They they just, they've been back over there maybe in the last five or six years. How about that? Uh, but, so there was Homer's, there was um, Custer's. It was called, well, it was called Graffiti's after 85, but it was called Custer's. I think Kenny Cox and maybe Gary Summers may have been involved in that. Gary later opened cartoons, but you know, that was after 85. <laughs> so there were that, and there was Lindbergh's down on Commercial Street, right. which has been revitalized. Right. Um, there was the Buffalo Bar down there. On Commercial? Yeah. 
So, I don't know that Route 66 really, at that time, had anything to do with with stuff opening. Okay, you, you had mentioned two of the places, uh, the hangar and the Regency. Let's start with the hangar. Um, tell me again where exactly that was located. The hangar, the hangar was located at the time behind Central Dodge, which was at the corner of St. Louis and National. Okay. Okay, Central Dodge moved over by KY3 on Sunshine, and after that happened, <laughs> Dylan's built the grocery store that's there now, and then Dylan's Dylan's left the market, and Price Cutter, I think, bought those buildings and moved into that. Mm -hmm. And the hangar is behind that, or to the east. To the east, okay, yeah. But it's right on St. Louis Street or Old Route 66. There's a there's there's a concrete pad still there right now. And it was just an old round Quonset hut that Brad Peterson had turned into a bar. And so, so that's what it looked like on the outside. Describe what it looked like on the inside. Do you remember? Well, <laughs> uh, the, the stage was kind of in the back corner mm -hmm. as you come in. Right. And the seating was along that same wall. Now, keep in mind that that wall is at an angle because it's a Quonset hut. Mm -hmm. And then... To the other side of the room, uh, next, you know, even with the stage, were a couple pool tables, and then the bathroom, and then the bar. Okay. So when you come in, you had the bar to the right, you had seating to the left, you go down a ways, you had the bathrooms to the right, you had the stage to the left, and the pool tables to the left, and then you had a door that went outside, and behind it was an outbuilding that they used for... Uh, <laughs> offices and dressing rooms and you know mm -hmm. a kind of a green room before band would go on stage because right. there wasn't a lot of room in it i'm sure there wasn't um you, you mentioned the owner who's the owner of the, the guy who started it and owned it was brad peterson brad he peterson. later sold it to eddie williamson and i can't remember how long eddie ran it and do you remember any of the other people who worked there uh dave bauer was one of the bartenders, mm -hmm. and he has a restaurant in town now called Coyotes. Oh, yeah. uh, Coyotes over at uh, Glenstone and uh, close to Sunshine. Sunshine, and then he has the one in Nixa. Uh, do you recall if there was a house band? No, I don't recall them doing a house band mm -hmm. so much. They may have had bands that played there a lot, but you know, it. <laughs> <laughs> there, the, I remember the Morels played there one night, and they were just that was when they just were really tight and they rocked. And the Morels were at that time were Lou Whitney, Mary Lee, who Lou was married to at the time, Donnie Thompson, and Ron Grimp. That was that was who the band was that played there at that time. And were they touring? They toured regionally and nationally, and had been written up in Playboy magazine and. They were just, I mean, that was the best time I remember. The best band I remember those guys being in was the Morales. Was that before 1985? It was. Mm -hmm. The the Shake and Push album, I think, came out in 83. It's the one that had the song on there about Reds, which was right on Route 66, west of the square. Wow. Uh, other bands, you know, there are bands like the Blenders and... Just other local bands, you know, some of the lesser bands would play there during the week. Mm -hmm. um, Weekends were the big. Right. Big but, you know, he booked the regional stuff too, like the Clocks and I'm trying to think of some of the other Kansas City bands. How often was it open? Was it open every night or? You know, I'm guessing it was open at least. Maybe Tuesday through Saturday, okay. probably close Sunday and Monday. Right, right. But I can't remember that for sure. Late night. They stay yeah, open? they would stay. They would stay open until they had to close. You know, for alcoholic. Mm -hmm. You know, one one o'clock or whatever. Okay. Um, so, what was the clientele like 
from your memory, was it mostly local people? It was uh, older college students and younger local people, yes. But mostly a younger crowd? Yeah. Right? And what was, what was it rock music exclusively or were they bringing in other kinds of music? It, it was pretty much rock and roll. Mm -hmm. I don't remember a country act playing there, okay. but I could be, I could be wrong. I mean, they had stuff there all the time, so I don't remember all of them. Um, as far as the audience was concerned, mixed race, mostly white. What was the? Do you remember? Yeah, probably mostly white back then, just because I don't know that there was as many blacks in town. Mm -hmm. um, what about the gender ratio? Male to female, mixed. Probably. Pretty even. Yeah. And uh, college students would would be attracted to places. Like yeah, college students of age, or college students who could get a fake ID, yeah. or uh, you know maybe maybe locals that that were out of college but still lived in town and probably weren't married yet. You know that type of clientele. Mm -hmm. And was it only musical acts that were there? Um, yeah, I don't remember him ever doing any comedy or okay. anything like that. Okay. It was pretty much just bands. Yeah. The, I don't even know that he did any DJs. I don't know that, uh. you know, DJs were mostly for like the dance clubs. Like, you know, back then, this isn't even so popular anymore. Back then, it was like uh, Merlin's and Wicker Works. Like maybe Merlin's was part of the Hilton out north of town, okay. the old hotel that Tim O'Reilly tore down and put another hotel and the Macadoodles there. Mm -hmm. And then the Sheraton that was south of town that they tore down and built that Lucky's mm -hmm. right there by Friendly Ford. Yeah. Well, it's Corwin Ford now, but um, <laughs> there was a Wicker Works in there. And those two were pretty much DJs and dancing, you know. Hanger, pretty much a showcase band. Right. Same thing with, well, this isn't on Route 66, but same thing with the Mother Load Homers, and then it was called the Bottom Line. So you, that's almost like you have two different kinds of venues there. You've got the dance clubs, and then you've got the live music right. clubs. And right. And probably not mixing too much. With right. Those. Yeah. You know, and you got to remember, this is right at the beginning of 84. 84 was when I really remember MTV. Mm -hmm. being a thing and at the time I lived in a house with three or four other guys on Cherry Street and we had MTV on all the time yeah yeah it's not the same anymore no <laughs> it's, it was you know without there being so much so much computerized music and the internet and stuff like that I mean well the showcase bars were all about bands mm-hmm you know, either local bands or regional bands or, uh, and that's that's the way the Regency was because kind of about the time the hangar died out, the Regency started coming of age. They probably overlapped by a year or two. And he, I, you may not remember specifically about the hangar, but if you do, it, is was there one band that showed up at the hangar that just really blew you? Yeah, the Morels. Okay. Um, the Morels and the Clocks. The Multiple clocks. times or just once? Well, I only saw the Clocks there one time. Okay. The Morels, I probably saw more than once, mm -hmm. but there was one night I just remember them just really could have been from all the little kings I drank, but uh, <laughs> I mean. Lou had that band dialed in back at that time. Mm -hmm. They were awesome. And do you have any, for lack of a better term, memorable occasions that stand out in your mind at the hangar? Anything that happened that you thought, whoa? Just anything. It could be good. Or well, bad. it wouldn't. It wouldn't be what most people would think about. It. Like I remember when we did Head East in there, we had to tie the power in live. And then I just remember how how loud they were. Uh 
they were louder than any band I heard in there. And it could have been because Larry Hampton was around the sound, but, <laughs> but uh, just the other thing is Brad and his bouncers a couple of years when we did concerts at McDonald Arena like Cheap Trick, mm -hmm. they were our security. Mm -hmm. That was one thing I remember. I don't, I don't know that anything, the clocks, the morels being really good that one night, head east, you know, full space band gear, the hangar burnt down at one point and full space band gear was in there. I don't remember, I remember going there a lot, but those are the things that stand out in my mind. Was the hangar still operating in 1985 as the hangar? I think it was. Okay. I think and probably not, not too much longer after that. Okay. I think it was maybe, I, I went in there when Eddie owned it because I kind of worked with this band called Teacher's Pet for a while. They were out of Lamar and uh, they were pretty good. We thought they would they would make some noise, might maybe make it. And I, I think they had a hard time keeping the band together. Were you doing lighting? No, I was just uh, wor working with them, maybe trying to help them get more gigs, mm -hmm. possibly managing them. Mm -hmm. uh, only that would have just been because I knew them, not not because I was trying to be a band manager. Not contractual or anything. But right. Yeah. Right. But you were already getting involved with that. Yeah. Yeah. Do you, do you uh, what about the Regency? Uh, where was well, it located? The Regency is on Park Central East. Is that what you call that street? Yeah. Uh, but it's right there, just down a few businesses from the Gilloys. Yep. And uh, Gary, Gary Thomas started that. And I think he actually lived in the top floor of it. And the main entrance to the Regency wasn't off Park Central East. It was through the parking lot on the back side off of Olive Street. Okay. Because everybody would park north of Olive. There was a parking lot there at Olive and Boonville, I guess. I guess that's what you call that on the north side. Everybody parked there and walk across, the, walk across Olive Street and go in the back door. Okay. Was uh, there an entrance on... On Saint Louis, or no, Park East? There was, but he didn't really use it like okay. that. Everybody came in the back. Okay. And oh man, Gary had tons of people play there. Okay. I mean the Steve Bob and Rich, the Rainmakers. He had uh you know, the couch dancers. He had he had one New Year's Eve, we did Leon Russell and Edgar Winter. The Georgia Satellites played there. Before Gary had some sound and lighting, well, I would take lighting in there and do shows for him. Uh, Georgia Satellite, Steve Bob and Rich, the Rainmakers, the Fabulous Thunderbirds played there, Richard Marks played there, and uh, he played there one year, and then the next year he was a headlining act at Hammond Student Center. That's how far up his Richard career came. Yeah. So Gary, Gary, Gary <clears throat> had his ear too where the music was at. He would, he he had a knack for booking somebody on their way up. Uh -huh. And you know, they'd be at his club one year and the next year they'd be in arenas or bigger venues. Wow. Was was it a bigger club than the hangar? It, it was a little bigger than the hangar. The sound in there was just awful though. Oh, really? It was like playing in a bathroom. Uh -huh. uh, it was a really live room and you know, a few years ago, I had a sound engineer tell me when they were complaining about the reverberation of the Shrine Mosque, mm -hmm. he's like, you either got to be below it or you got to be above it. Mm -hmm. And what he meant by that is if you play at a low volume in a really live room like that, you don't, you don't create so much slap back off the walls right. because you're not, you don't have it turned up enough. And the, and the other angle on that it's just have it so damn loud you don't hear the slap back off the walls. You know what I mean? Like painfully loud. Yeah. Oh yeah, <laughs> there's a lot of noise, yes. All right. Uh, so, and there were, there were <clears throat> many other acts he'd had. Was he, that pre-1985? 
It was probably just before 85. Uh-huh. Yeah, uh, I just remember the hangar and the Regency kind of overlapping by a couple of years. Yep. It and was it was maybe 84, maybe 83, but I'm pretty sure he was in place before 85, and then he lasted a long time after that into the 90s. What did the Regency <laughs> look like on the inside? What was it? Well, it was called the Regency uh, Showcase. You know, it was kind of built as a ballroom. Uh-huh. You know, it had a mirror ball on it. It was an old department store, you know, because it's on Route 66 close mm -hmm. to the square. It, it was like, uh, I don't know, it was a hard floor. It wasn't concrete, but it was like a tile, mm -hmm. and the walls were hard. And then there was a balcony in the back, and underneath the balcony is a bar. But then they had a balcony, and he did some underage shows too, where the underage kids sit in the balcony, and the above-age people were down below. But if it was an all-age crowd, he would have a bar open Upstairs too, I believe. So but, like theater seating? Or? No, he had tables, tables most of the time. Mm -hmm. He may have done. He may have done theater seating on some shows. Mm -hmm. I think he had the Chippendales in there one time, you know. But he was mostly bands. And was it mostly rock music the same way? Mostly. He may have had a country actor too. I can't remember if the Undergrass Boys played there or not. You know, they had a, there are some quirky bands like the Couch Dancers, which I believe was Lumpy and and uh, Todd. Oh, I can't think of Todd's last name. Todd Jones. Uh, yeah, and Jay. I'm not Facebook friends with Jay. Oh, there's this guy who was on the music scene for five or ten years in the 80s and early 90s. Jay Floyd. Mm -hmm. I don't think Jay li even lives in town anymore. Uh, you know, and the and the the Pepper Cats played there. They were an all girl band. Uh, Terry, uh, Jim Warnerly's wife, um, Katie Kaufman, Sharon Ward. I don't remember the other girl's name. Um, but that's really interesting, though, that you that you said he was able to uh, sort of discern which groups were were hot on the way up. Yeah, uh, yeah. Well, you know, a few years ago, this didn't have anything to do with '85, but a few years ago, five to ten years ago, he tried reopening that as the Regency, and it didn't work for him mm -hmm. because the whole the whole mindset of the market's changed. Yeah. The college kids are different. And yeah, sure. Um, it was a late night club too, I, I'm sure they, they were. Yeah, they yeah. stay open until they had to close. Yeah. Um, and weekends were the biggest, were, were when the biggest acts came in. Yeah, I think, you know, unlike the hangar, the hangar was pretty much open every night, maybe even if they didn't have a band, mm -hmm. with the exception of Sunday and maybe Monday. Uh, the Regency didn't open unless they had an act. Uh huh. So. Was it regular? I mean, were they? I, I think. Uh, -huh. uh, I could be wrong on that, but he, he may have had it both ways, so mm -hmm. there may have been some nights he was closed and other nights he was open even though he didn't have a band. Mm -hmm. But, you know, there really wasn't a draw unless there was a band in there. Right. The same kind of clientele as the, as the hangar or different? It was a lot. Uh, the clientele was very similar because they were both kind of showcase bars. Mm -hmm. um, College students, younger adults. Yeah. Um, any any memorable occasions that stand out at the Regency that just blew you away? Or? Oh, it was pretty cool getting to do Leon Russell and the Edgar Winter Group on New Year's Eve. Were you were you involved? In I that? was running lights. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Was that fun? It was. It was. It was fun. You know, I wasn't as big a fan of as Leon Russell, but when I was in the seventh grade in like '73, I had Edgar Winter's uh, album that had uh, 
Frankenstein on it, and then I had come on and take a free ride. I had that album, and we wore that out. You know, and Rick Derringer was in his band. I don't know that Rick Derringer played with him that night, but he was he was really good in concert. And how old were you when you were? How old was I then? Yeah. I I don't know. In my up in my twenties. That may that that may have been just after eighty five. Mm -hmm. It was in the eighties. Mm -hmm. But uh, I'm thinking it was you know. 86 or 87. Okay. okay. Um, and and when, did, when did it close for good? Do you remember? No, I don't. He was open quite a while, maybe sometime mid to late 90s. Okay. And then he moved to LA or moved to California. And I think the building was closed for a long time. And then Paul Sunday rented it from him and opened it as the icon. And then Paul got into big whiskeys and now he's got big whiskeys all over the place. Mm -hmm. He franchises them. But then after the icon, it was something else. And then Gary opened it again as a Regency. And I, I don't know, it may be closed now. I don't, know, I don't know what's in there now, but you know, it was one of those things where it had that window where it was it was pretty cool. Sweet spot, yeah. Like the hangar. Do, do you have any idea about the interaction between these venues and other nearby businesses on Route 66? Did they, did other businesses benefit from the clubs or did the clubs present problems? Uh, you know, I mean, I think about like motels and restaurants and things like that. I don't, I don't know. Like, uh, I don't remember them causing problems. I don't remember them. Not a constant police presence there. No. Trouble. But, you know, I think kids back then just got drunk, you know. <laughs> and uh, there may have been occasional, occasional problem because of that. But, I mean, you know, back then people weren't looking to go out and just shoot people right, just right. for the hell of it. Um, it I, I, don't, I don't remember... There being huge problems either way, mm -hmm. or huge. You, you said it wasn't really important for these clubs to be fronted on, on Route 66, and in fact the Regency wasn't actually fronted on it, so it probably didn't matter, but did it matter that it well, was, for the, instance, that it was located downtown? Is that, was that a big deal? Well, the Regency was right on the... But the entrance was on the back side. Yeah, yeah, but that building, uh -huh. it was set up for the main entrance to be on the other side, uh -huh. even though he he flipped it. Uh -huh. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. It was back when there was shopping in there, sure. it was set up for him to come in off Route 66. Sure. Um, Which was more beneficial to him, do you think, being just that close to, to the square or? Well, I'm having a hard time remembering the square. The square has been open, it's been closed, uh -huh. it's been open. It's been open for now for quite a while, but yeah. there was a time there, maybe when I was in college during that time, when the square was closed. And I'm thinking that that's probably why he used the back as the main entrance, mm -hmm. because there was parking back there. Right. There was a parking lot, a smaller parking lot right next to the door. And then there was even more parking right across the street. Mm -hmm. um, so it, that's probably why it made more sense for sure. that to be the grand o or the main entrance. Yeah. Uh, at that time. Uh, um, how did these How did these clubs, the the Hangar and the Regency, compare to other clubs off of Route sixty six? Um, did were they doing better, worse, the same? Well, I think these clubs primarily opened up and were successful where they were because of their proximity to the college and downtown and mm -hmm. you, you know and and <coughs> <coughs> you know route 66 being where it was because it went through downtown and you know businesses built to it probably had more to do with it 
with these guys opening these businesses where the buildings were at and where the streets were at more than anything, more than because it was Route 66. Mm -hmm. It was because it was where there were buildings and where it was close to a crowd. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. I mean, you could say, well, open a club right across from Missouri State, but there really isn't buildings unless you build one. Mm -hmm. Well, it's expensive to do that. Sure. You know, if you're going to open a club, you want to find an old building that you can rent really cheap. Mm -hmm. And it, it probably has more to do with that than than anything to do with Route 66. Mm -hmm. Yeah, where there was space. Uh, the only uh, the only reason why it would be close to Route 66 is because stuff built to Route 66, and that's where stuff was at. Buildings, people, so that's why bars opened there. Not be, not because it was Route 66, but more as a residual. Of what Route 66 carry over from the previous period, from the previous right. generation, right? When Route 66 was so hot, uh, and like I said, I don't think I don't think any of those people back then thought, "Well, I'm going to open next to Route 66." Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I don't I don't think anybody cared about that. By then, it was gone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, what about other locations uh, outside well, of downtown? Uh, clubs <laughs> outside of, out of Outside of the downtown area. Um, well, I thought about that, and if Route 66 come in Kearney Street, up until a few years ago, there was a Butler building out there called Lerb. Well, initially, when I was in college, and I went out there and worked the shows I have listed here, Michael Martin Murphy, Ronnie Mills Sapp. Oh, I worked Bachman Turner Overdrive out there. Mm -hmm. uh, it was right on Kearney Street mm -hmm. before Route 66 turned okay. south on Glenstone. Mm -hmm. So there was that one. Originally it was Lurby's Auditorium. Probably after 1985 sometime, it may have switched owners. They changed the name to the Hitching Post. And then, and then when it was last open, it was called Cowboy 2000s. Some guy got murdered out there in the parking lot. And that probably kind of started scaring people away from there. So that building doesn't exist anymore. Then you come down to Glenstone, there for the long time in the 80s and into the 90s, there was a club there called the Townhouse. And there was a house band there called the Lefty Brothers. And the Lefty Brothers consisted of Kerry and Tracy Cole brothers, and then Danny, can never remember Danny's last name, played bass, and Pete Generous played drums. Well, for the longest time, Carrie and Tracy Cole have been in Tony Orlando's band, and Carrie still is. And Pete Generous is out playing with the Texas Tenors, but he had played with the Bald Nibers and Roy Clark, and um, so they were the house band there. No, the they were there six nights a week, like maybe every night except Sunday, mm -hmm. and they lived in apartments across. Glenstone from there, yep. but Donna Ellison owned that place, and I'm thinking it pretty much worked because of the Lefty Brothers. They were good networkers. They were great guys. They would play all the benefits around town. They would play Firefall. They would play in the gazebo for for um, Hal Meadows at Swiss Villa. They'd open for Mitch Ryder and the Detroit Wheels and in Hammond Student Center. They opened for the Beach Boys like six or seven times. Yes. Uh, and then all those people that saw them open or play at all those other gigs would come to the townhouse. Uh, and uh, I think after the Lefty Brothers left and pretty much started working with Tony, well, they had a, they had a farewell show for the townhouse and I think after after all that in there, they uh, the townhouse pretty much closed. So it was open a couple of years before '85, mm -hmm. and then I put the new BGO Theater in there because it would have been it was kind of under the viaduct, and I've only heard people 
talk about this. I don't think the, so. This, I, I, I never was in this place myself. Okay. Uh, it was on Traffic Way, okay. kind of under Glenstone. Yeah. So it was kind of under Route 66 uh -huh. uh, before it turned down St. Louis Street. Mm -hmm. And that's where Randall Chowning got John Dillon and Larry Lee together to first have a songwriters thing, and that's what became the Ozark Mountain Daredevils. That was where they first got together at. Where? What year and approximately did that again? Seventy-one. Okay. And Kurt Hargis and Steve Canada owned that club. Steve Canada later. Played in the Daredevils, played drums and guitar, and but he got killed in a plane crash 22 or three years ago in downtown Nashville. Kurt Hargis is still around. I think he lives out of town on a farm. But um, so coming this way, Lurvie's Townhouse, New Biggio, The Hangar. You know, I put the Jewel Theater in there. But it I, it wasn't really a club. It was a theater where they where they taped the Ozarks Jubilee, mm -hmm. or they didn't tape it. They did it live. live yeah. um, it's right there at at uh, Jefferson and St. Louis. Then the Regency. Then on the square, there was a department store called Barfs. I think uh, it was called that probably before I came here. But after Brad Peterson left the hangar, he opened up a club there called Butterfields. And uh, uh, the, the History Museum, I think, has that now. Mm -hmm. But I remember doing an Australian act in there. We did Sound and Lights, an Australian act in there for the grand opening. And I think Rule Chapel used to play in there. The piano player plays with the, played with the Daredevils in the 70s, and he still goes out and plays bongos and sings with them. When would that grand opening have been, do you remember? See, that could have been after 85. Mm -hmm. I just don't remember the exact year. Mm -hmm. So that one, I don't know how you would study that. Probably archive newspaper articles yeah. in the news leader. And then you got Reds on the way out of town. I don't know. Did Reds have live music? You know, I don't know. Hell, it wasn't big enough. <laughs> um, if they did, it might have been outside. Um, and I never was really there that much. Mm -hmm. That's, you know, the Morels. if you listen to the Morels record, they got a song in there called Reds. And it's about that place. Okay. And not only that, there's a YouTube video that they did with that song from Reds before it tore, they tore it down. You know, and now, now Dave Campbell, who owns uh, Buckingham's, mm -hmm. he's got that replica of Reds out, Sunshine. Yeah, right, out further west, yeah. You know, Red and I, I asked him, I'm like, why come you didn't build it down there on Route 66? And he's like, he's like, man, there's not enough traffic goes by there anymore. Uh -huh. You know, he goes, it's got to work, too. Mm -hmm. Got to work financially. Yeah. Because yeah. they built a brand new building. and Pretty big one, too. Yeah. It's pretty good. I like their tenderloin, and they and they hand cut fries. Uh -huh. That was the thing that disappointed me about Ebbetsville. You know, it's been through several owners, mm -hmm. and the new owners don't have hand cut fries. It's like, <laughs> so I'm I'm trying to think if there are any other clubs, and if there were, see Randall Chowning or somebody like that would be a good guy to talk to about this mm -hmm. because. He st he's the one who started the Daredevils. Uh, supposedly PBS is doing a segment on the history of the Daredevils. Right. Hope they don't screw that up. <laughs> because the other guys are going to try to change the story. Of course. Yeah. But Randall put the band together. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, nobody thought anything about it. So they got a record deal and started recording with Glenn Johns. Mm -hmm. Have you seen the Beatles Get Back deal? I have not heard all about it, but I haven't seen it yet. The sound engineer in that documentary is the guy that recorded them. Yeah, I've heard that. Yeah, that's, that's pretty amazing. Yeah. yeah. Well, 
Um, I, I, I would like to think that what I've given you would be more valuable if you follow up on some of it mm -hmm. and find other people sure. who know more. Find a couple of people who were here in the 70s. Yep. I don't know how far back you want to go. but oh, As far back as we can, but that's, that's just the problem is finding people that, that remember. Gary Thomas at the Regency, Brad Peterson and Eddie Williamson at the Hangar, Donna Elson at the Townhouse, Lurvie's Auditorium is probably Rob Lurvy. He Lurvy owns a lot of that land up there on Kearney Street. Uh, the Chul Theater. Well, Tom, what's Tom's last Tom name? Peters. Tom Peters. He's the one doing all the Jubilee stuff. Is he getting all the kinescope, kinescope recordings? Yeah, uh, we've got about seventy of them. Yeah. You got them converted? They're, yeah, they're on YouTube. Butterfields was Brad Peterson. So you could, if you get a hold of him, you could talk to him about the hangar in Butterfields. Reds. I, I don't know. If you could talk to, talk to Donnie Thompson. Lou Whitney's passed away. But Don, Donnie Thompson would know the clubs too. Because he was here in the 70s, grew up here. And where is Donnie Thompson? It's Springfield. From the time period you're talking about, I kind of came in on the last three years of that. Mm -hmm. From 83 to 85, you know, 83 was about when I really started working in clubs because I would go help load in for 20, 30, 40 dollars. Right. You know, because my rent was a little over a hundred bucks back then. So 20, 30, 40 dollars, you know, if I wasn't working a bigger show I was making more money on, I was there. I would go, because this was what I wanted to do. Yeah. I mean, I'd go work a show. Sure. And uh, so I've let you know as much as I can recall about it. Yeah. You know, in the 70s, I think a lot of them played at, uh, well, the new Biggio in the early 70s, Half a Hill Club, yep. which was out at... Battlefield and Pine. Right. I think the Dares played there because Randall Chowning let me listen to a tape that was recorded there live. Uh, Lindbergh's, maybe the Buffalo Bar on commercial. That's, that's, I'm drawing a blank after that. That's all right. That's, that's, this is great. This has been very helpful, Mark. I certainly appreciate you, you, you coming to talk to us.